We are In Conversation with the Sanford School, a podcast from the T. Denny Sanford School of Social and Family Dynamics at Arizona State University, designed to showcase timely and informative insights from leading faculty, researchers, and other experts which impact the ever-changing social world we live in. Here at the Sanford School, we recognize that the lands where we are hosting this conversation at Arizona State University belong to the Maricopa and Pima peoples, and we are privileged that we can welcome you to today's conversation. In today's podcast, we're excited to be in conversation with our special guest to discuss Domestic Violence Awareness Month. Please note that this podcast contains sensitive material such as discussions of domestic violence situations and other abuse. At the conclusion of the podcast, we will mention a variety of helpful resources. Our guest today is Gordon Sims, Director of Philanthropy at the Sojourner Center in Phoenix. Our host of today's podcast is Marcella Gemelli, Senior Lecturer here in ASU School of Social and Family Dynamics. Gordon, Welcome to the podcast and take it away, Marcella. Thanks, John. Thank you, Gordon, so much for being here today. This is an important month um, and um, one that we like to, to draw awareness to. And I thought it would be a fitting subject for one of our Sanford School podcasts, um, since we like to, to focus on issues, that, social issues that are important and also um, reaching out to our community members um, about it. So first, uh, you know, maybe you could tell us about, um, I mean, just for viewers who may not know, uh, what is domestic violence? Who is affected by it? Well, domestic violence uh, is an imbalance of power in relationships that is typically characterized by a series of coercive and controlling behaviors that tend to start off in a very uh, non-threatening way and then slowly increase as the relationship builds and develops. And, you know, something that people continue to ask us is, you know, why don't women leave abusers? And the thing is, is that people who are abusers don't have tags or labels on them that, that say when you turn over the label for washing instructions that this person may be abusive or tend to have coercive and controlling behavior problems. And so domestic violence is also just a social illness that has existed for hundreds of years. There have been imbalances in relationships for a very long time. And I think one of the big challenges in domestic violence, particularly in the United States, is that it has been kind of hidden away as a secret family problem and something that neighbors and families don't talk about. And so, you know, we really didn't see a huge social concern until really the uh, O.J. Simpson trial, <clears throat> excuse me, was played. And then all of a sudden, there developed momentum besides the feminism times and uh, movements in the past that people started to really pay attention to domestic violence. And so Sojourner Center has existed since 1977 and we've been in, uh, overcoming the impact of domestic violence one life at a time since then. Um, unfortunately, still in the United States, one in three women will be a victim of domestic violence in her lifetime, and one in seven men will be a victim of domestic violence in their lifetimes. It's, it's tough. Um, you know, it's really tough to hear those numbers because I don't feel like they've moved that much. Um, you know, it seems to be a steady issue that, you know, again, needs to continue to be addressed. It's interesting though how you said sometimes these momentous moments though these you know kind of drive awareness um which i suppose could be a good thing but the event's not a good thing to to feed the awareness but no. are there other um kind of issues or events that have happened since that draw our attention how about this time of covid what are we what are we seeing um with numbers you know with with the pandemic uh, we recently just saw a report from the city of Phoenix that showed that calls for help through the police department increased 36% from last year at this time. 
and the challenges that are that we are having and that that all shelters and victims who want to become survivors are having is that everything has slowed down because typically a, a participant, a woman and her children or a gentleman and, and children will come to Sojourner Center and they have about 120 days to be able to uh, participate in all of our programs and classes. And then through that process, they get to choose, do they want to participate in a two year program where they could also be in transitional housing. But because people were staying at home, people have been laid off, um, it has put abusers and the people they harm in the homes together for longer periods of time, which disables um, a survivor's ability to make that quiet phone call for help. And so, you know, what we have found also is that resources have kind of slowed down. Here at Sojourner Center, we would normally be able to house 94 uh, individuals at our campuses, but because of the pandemic and social distancing, we've had to work to mitigate in our populations and a lot of people, including us, didn't even think about this in the beginning. And so we would typically have 94 women and their children or people in our campus. Right now we have 68. And so because of that, people who need our services are not able to access them because all of the shelters are basically in the same scenario. I hadn't, I, you know, that didn't cross my mind. I hadn't thought about that as, um, you know, a limiting factor to the resources that you provide. Yeah, you know, typically, I mean, people don't realize, but more than half of the population on most DB campuses in the United States are children. And so the other issue is that children haven't been able to go to school until just recently. And so the moms, even if they had jobs, were back here at the shelter um, supervising their children while they were taking classes. So it really has slowed down the process. Now we do have children going back to school um, last week and this week, but we still have to stay on alert because we just don't know how smoothly that's going to go. I do have to say that although the families kind of feel a little stuck here, um, they keep working and doing their lives and moving beyond the impact of domestic violence. And I just have to say that's one of the things that helps keep all of us going, um, coming to work every day here at Sojourner Center. That resiliency of you know, yes. keep going and yeah, and, and probably a lot of times for their children and to move forward. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. So what other, um, I, you know, you mentioned resources. What other resources or who do you connect with? I, I know that I uh, lost our home. A lot of people don't think about the pets that yes. may be affected or the families that, you know, rely on their, their pets as loved ones. Um, I know that lost our home, you've been uh, connected with them, but are there other, the Arizona Coalition of Domestic Violence, and, you know, what are the organizations and agencies do you uh, work with in Phoenix? We work with so many organizations. We have a great relationship with the Phoenix Children's Hospital who come, they bring their big mobile hospital and that big beautiful uh, bus and they come and treat our children two to three times a week. Lost Our Home Pet Rescue is a great partner. A lot of people don't realize, but even the federal government is starting to become aware of this and it is the value and the profound nature of the bond between children and their pets and even adults and their pets. And so there is a whole bunch of research and brain mapping happening that's starting to show that our bonds with our pets sometimes are just as profound and deep, if not more sometimes, than they are with our own human family members. And so when you ask people who've experienced domestic violence who have a pet companion, more than 40% of them say they won't leave if they have to leave the pet behind because the pets are quite often used as pawns in this abuse. We also have great relationships with you, Mom, because they are fantastic at getting people rapid rehousing. We work with the Ability 360 Center, Fresh Start Women's uh, Foundation we've worked with for years. We co uh, co-sponsor classes there. 
So we we worked with Tumbleweed when they were still a, a part of the, or, the Valley. So we really partner with everyone we can because we just had our big fundraising event and the theme for the event was Together We Thrive. And we just really believe that's the case all the time, especially with those of us working in nonprofits. Mm -hmm. It's it's good to hear about those coalitions because it's, imagine again, um, you know, sometimes when we go through economic recessions and things like that, resources for the nonprofits tend to decline because people don't have the money to contribute or whatever. So I imagine there's a benefit to pooling some resources sometimes. It's very helpful. And, you know, we're also really close with the Arizona Coalition Against Domestic and Sexual mm -hmm. Violence. We're great partners with them. And it really just does make a difference. You know, two things we really try not to do is duplicate processes or programs that other people are doing really well. And we also just like to consider the fact that we do live in an abundant world and there are enough resources for all of us. And it's just those collaborations give us the opportunity to see what we're all working on and how we might be able to maximize our efforts rather than all of us working on the same project in eight different ways. So collaboration is really important. And I think as we move further into whatever's going to happen um, in November, that collaborations continue to just need to be stronger. Yeah. Do you do any um, do you have any collaborations outside of Arizona, more nationally, or is it pretty focused on the local level? No, we have had some really great relationships with some domestic violence programs, one in Alaska, uh, several in Ohio, um, California. Sojourner Center beyond our pet companion shelter also was one of the leaders in the Valley for a, a little more than a couple of years for something called the Maricopa MC3DV, which is a Maricopa Coalition Against uh, Traumatic Brain Injury and Domestic Violence Programs. Mm -hmm. And so we've been working with, we have been working with the Cactus Foundation, the Marley Foundation, and other organizations because there's all of this great data in uh, traumatic brain injury for people who've uh, fought in wars, people who participate in um, professional sports. But when you look at traumatic brain injury research done in victims of domestic violence, there's very little. And so we've been working with Barrow to create a, uh, an assessment tool and also then uh, treatment for people who've experienced traumatic brain injury. And we even have a, a little duplex house that's uh, next to our, part of our campuses mm -hmm. that's just a little different on the inside to help people who've experienced traumatic brain injury live in more muted colors, not so bright lights, and it just gives them an opportunity to do their healing, not necessarily in the bigger uh, crisis shelter campus setting. Wow, that's that's amazing. Yeah. That's really cool. Well, one of the things Sojourner Center has been famous for is being considered a low to no barrier access shelter. And what we realized after we started looking at research that was done years ago was that, you know, a lot of participants who have been here and have may experience traumatic brain injury, if we're not offering that opportunity for them to heal from that, they still are leaving with significant barriers. And that could be reading comprehension, the ability to support their children when they're doing their homework. And I haven't experienced traumatic brain injury. And I was helping one of my nieces back in Ohio just doing her long form division. And it was like trying to read German. I had no idea what they were doing. So it really is a valuable tool is to be able to offer TBI uh, services because we want people that come to Sojourner Center to be as equipped as they can be to be successful when they leave. Mm. And what what is that process? I I mean I just imagine um, you know mother and her children coming um, from a very disruptive situation. Um, I know you give them the, the the place and the safety and the the tools. How is it when they when they leave? I, I hope that um, you know they they stay safe. And and is there some kind of process for for that? There is definitely a process. And in the beginning, when participants first get to Sojourner Center, the first thing we really do is give them that opportunity to just 
ground themselves, you know, see where they are, get comfortable with where they are in their bodies at that time, because they've been taught that it isn't okay to feel okay in their bodies ever since they've been in that relationship. And so then, you know, we meet with them initially and we use something uh, called a scale. It's the scales for determining, oh, I just, it just left my head. But what it is, is it's our assessment tool, but we let them assess themselves where they are when they get to Sojourner Center with one of our domestic violence advocates and a case manager. And so it could be things like, um, I want to pursue education. I want to begin a life pursuing the religion I grew up with. I want to make sure that I'm a better parent. So parenting classes. I know that the abuse, you know, I was strangled a lot. So I would like to get assessments to see how the strangulation may have affected other systems in my body. But what's so interesting is we do that scales assessment with them when they arrive, and then we do it again in two weeks. And it is fascinating to just see how just in those two weeks, their priorities shift. Mm -hmm. It might shift from those things to, I really do wanna go back to school and I wanna be able to afford housing. I'd like to get involved in some vocational education and I'd like my children to go through some behavioral health therapy. And I wanna learn how to be a better pet or a better pet mom to our cats and dogs that are also at Sojourner Center. And then we follow that scales assessment tool during the 120 days they're here with us and adjustment as they move on. But, but as they move forward, the number one thing we always work with them on is the mantra that safety is an illusion. And we do a lot of safety planning, talking about, you know, when is the time that you're most vulnerable when you're getting your car keys to get into your vehicle? Mm -hmm. You know, always checking where you are and who's around you and making sure that you have a buddy meeting you somewhere if your abuser is still free and, and you know he's around the valley and could find you. So. Safety planning really is the number one thing that we do because if you look at the old hierarchy of needs, if somebody doesn't feel safe mm -hmm. and a sense of belonging, then they're not going to be able to achieve anything else. Right, that's such yeah. a basic basic need to be able to move forward to those more self-actualizations and getting that education or, or what it might be on that list. And, one, and an example of that is, is we had this really, really sweet, fun, intelligent, creative woman who came here several years ago, and she had finally made it out of the crisis program and went down to our apartments. And what's nice is that the apartments are within walking distance of the shelter, so the participants can walk back down to the shelter and ask for help or get guidance from us, and that's the reason we built them that close. And she said... I was just getting ready to create my first shopping list in my adult life. And she said, my abuser used to say to me, here's the list. You have 60 minutes and he'd click a timer and he'd send her to the store. And when she would get home, he would say, oh, I see you got everything on the list, except you didn't get milk. And she would say, well, you always just told me to get what's on the list to not get anything less or extra. And he said, but you knew the fridge didn't have milk in it. And so for her, creating a shopping list was a scary, difficult, creepy thing because it took her right to that place again. And so for her, the apartments were really important because she could walk down the street, sit down with one of our staff, and we just started with, okay, let's go back to your childhood and identify your five favorite foods. And so from that point on, you know, her first grocery list probably was pizza, ice cream, ho-hos, uh, frosted flakes, and milk. But what it did was give her that safe opportunity to start the foundation again from, from creating a grocery list. But it's also really great information for us because each participant has that unique mm -hmm experience that if they don't feel safe and they don't feel like they can be vulnerable in a situation where they're not going to get reprimanded for just asking for help, it really creates that powerful new pathway in their brain to then um, become a grocery shopping warrior at some point in her life. It's amazing. That's something so, you know, I'll just do a shopping list that we just you know, kind of one of the basic things that we do in our everyday life can trigger 
you know, some very uncomfortable feelings for people who, if you know, you've been reprimanded that you haven't followed the list or. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's, it's great to hear how individualized you, um, you know, the care that you give to, to the people who come to your shelter. Um, you know, I hate to say, you know, you can only help so many of uh, the women or others who come to your shelter. How do you help, I guess, maybe again, by um, relying on those other resources in the Valley, if, if um, people can come to you and you don't have the room in your shelter? So we typically do something, it, it's just one of the terms we use here. It's called resourcing. And typically if we get a call and we really are full all the time, I think all of the shelters are. Mm -hmm. I got on board at Sojourner Center in 2004 and actually had never worked in domestic violence. But when our, our CEO at the time, her name was Connie Phillips, she was here for 18 years. And I just remember her saying, Gordon, right now, this was 2004, we turn away 85% of the women and children who are seeking shelter beds. Mm -hmm. And I don't know what the actual percentage today is, and I'm guessing it's probably 50%. Um, and so what we do is we'll stay on the phone and, and you know bring them in if we can, or we will find something safe for them. There's a program here in the Valley also called Safe DVS, and that is a program where sometimes hotels will provide a couple nights of safety for somebody who just can't find shelter. But we just highlighted a woman that lives here now in our apartments, but she had two sons and two dogs. They lived in their Jeep in a Walmart parking lot for two weeks just because there were no shelter beds for her. And on top of that, she wasn't gonna go to shelter without her dogs. And so mm -hmm. they lived in a little Jeep on $67 of food stamps for two weeks until there was a bed at Sojourner. So it's still really, really difficult. I used to share this with people, but uh, in Maricopa County, I think there are 11 DV shelters and just south of the border. And this isn't a statement against a country or anything, but in, in Mexico, there are only eight DV shelters in the entire country. Oh. And so we also just have that challenge with being close to the border. That's another thing is, you know, the women and children that come here, their basic need is just to be safe and to be away from that abuser. A lot of times, you know, the women have learned how to manage the abuse. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's often when it's turned towards their children that they finally say, you know, that's not acceptable. And I don't want them to grow up in a family where their mother treated DV or domestic violence as if it was okay. You know, it was okay mm -hmm. for them to grow up in it. Right. It can yeah. take so much to leave that. Because sometimes it's financial security. I, you know, That's, there's so many reasons for someone to stay with someone. Um, it's, it's a, you know, a, a big step to to really confront that and disrupt your life. And I mean, it's being disrupted, but to you know, take it to that next level of of leaving the situation. And many times they've been told over and over um, that if they leave, yeah. they will kill them. And so it really is sometimes the most dangerous time in their lives is that courageous moment when they get away. And that's the other part of it is when they get away, they typically only have the children, um, a purse mm -hmm. and the clothes on their backs. Yeah. 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 Well, I think we could talk all day, but I want to yes. be mindful of, of your time. And, um, I know that you are very busy. Uh, so, uh, Thank you so much for, for everything you, you've talked to us about. Um, in this month of domestic violence awareness and, you know, all throughout the year, what can we do, um, you know, what, you know, we've heard of that bystander effect of like, we don't want to get, you know, like you said, kind of in the very beginning, you know, it's a private issue. We don't want to get involved. Um, but, you know, what can we, what, what can we do as just the general public or people, um, about, you know, about helping, helping people in these situations. You know, the thing that we do at Sojourner Center, and it's funny because I don't actually have one in my office right now. Um, 
we do something called a shoe card campaign. And this actually goes back into the 50s and 60s. But um, women started to realize that their abusers weren't looking in the soles of their shoes when they were looking for money or whatever they were looking for. And so what, what uh, DV shelters did was they created a trifold card that when you fold it up is just the size of a business card. But what it has on it is all of the available resources for domestic violence shelters in your local areas, the numbers, it has the information in English and Spanish. And so we have a lot of volunteers, corporate partners and organizations that come to Sojourner and pick up shoe cards and put them in the women's restrooms or the, all of the restrooms in their businesses. And that way it's a passive way for somebody to find a resource for domestic violence. For people that you might know and love who you think might be in a relationship like that, the best thing you can always do is to be supportive, to offer empathetic statements and to not make any forms of judgment or talk about getting away because they're still managing the abuse that they're experiencing. And it often seems like if we as people who love them and respect them tell them to try to get away, they kind of stand a little firmer for a little while. And so it really is about compassion, love, and respect. And you can also, if you have a friend who you know is experiencing domestic violence, create a coded dialogue so that she can give you messages without the abuser knowing she's giving you messages that might be something like, oh, I'm just calling to get your blueberry scone recipe. And you know that when she says that, that means that everything is okay. And if she's calling to ask for a cup of buttermilk, that might mean that uh, he beat me up last night and I might need mm -hmm. some help. And so it's also just getting creative like that. And I, I would love to say, you know, to call the police um, in dangerous situations. And, and I will say, you know, if somebody feels like their life is threatened to please do that. Um, but I have also just found that when the victims have somebody of support they can talk to, it doesn't cause those escalations that can cause really severe things to happen sometimes. So being supportive and extending October to the other 11 months of the year, because domestic violence really is one of the biggest social problems in our world, in the United States and in our community, and it isn't getting better and it will only until all of us take ownership of it. Mm. Yeah. Thank you so much, Gordon. Really appreciate your time. And thank you. It's important important that we talk about it and appreciate it. I agree. And and you guys, uh, you ever want to come for a tour? Let me know. I know you already know, but you know that's the other thing is that we do regularly scheduled tours, and we don't do it so we can show everybody our campus. We do it because there's such a us and them thinking regarding domestic violence victims and survivors and people who haven't experienced it. But the thing is, is that if it affects one in three or four women in the United States, it has affected all of us. Yeah. So. Thank you. Thank you. For helpful resources, please visit the National Network to End Domestic Violence at www.nnedv.org. You may also visit www.womenslaw.org. They have a variety of offers for free legal advice to any survivor of domestic violence and a directory of every advocate and shelter by state in the United States. You may also contact the following national hotlines. National Domestic Violence Hotline at 800-799-SAFE or the National Sexual Assault Hotline at 800-656-HOPE. If you would like to connect with today's podcast guests, please email the following. M. Jamelli that's G-E-M-E-L-L-I at A-S-U dot E-D-U for Marcella Gemelli. G Sims at Sojourner Center dot org 
that's S-O-J-O-U-R-N-E-R-C-E-N-T-E-R.org for Gordon Sims. You may also follow the Sojourner Center on social media. Find them on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter using their handle Sojourner Center. Connect with us and get access to all of our podcasts by visiting thesanfordschool.asu.edu forward slash podcast, where you will also find links to all of our social media channels. This conversation has come to an end, but our work here continues.